Okay, what we want to do today is we want to talk about a new topic. We want to talk about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Let me write this term up here for you. That term aggregate, what that refers to really is the macro economy. Aggregates, everything added together. And so this is sort of total demand and total supply of goods and services in the whole United States. Okay, aggregate. Aggregate demand and aggregate supply is not, even though there are some similarities, it is not the same as just supply and demand that we've already uh, been through. Supply and demand that we've already talked about is microeconomics. This is macroeconomics. And macroeconomics, you remember what we talked about, the fallacy of composition. The fallacy of composition says it is n not necessarily correct. It's a fallacious way of reasoning if you think that by understanding each microeconomic portion of the economy, each worker, each household, each market, it's a fallacy to say that by understanding what's going on with each microeconomic unit, you can just add all those up and you get the macroeconomic. Okay, so the fallacy of composition says you can't make that assumption and we won't make that assumption, but I'm telling you right now, don't make that assumption. Don't be thinking that, oh, aggregate demand, aggregate su supply, that's all the little demand curves added up and then all the little supply curves added up to get one big demand and one big supply and now you got the answer. It's not done that way. There are some similarities, but there are some differences too and I'll try and point those out as we go along. Uh, as we go into this, let me go back and review just slightly because we came through a lot of material in that last unit. Um, nominal GDP equals, I'm going to just put P times Q and then we'll talk about that for just a second. The P, this is the um, a price index and this is like the average, uh, I'll put a, the word index in there, but an index of the average price, prices of goods and services. I'll just say goods, but it means goods and services. Okay, and if you remember, we had different, we talked about like the consumer price index, and we talked about the GDP price deflator. And this is really not a dollar price, it's an index number. And let me again refresh your memory. Let's say that in the base year, we have a basket of goods and services that we can buy for $50. And then in the current year, that same uh, basket of goods and services costs $155. Oh, why don't I make that $150 to make it a little easier? Don't have to get my calculator out. Then what we would say is the consumer price index equals, it's the price of the basket in the current year divided by the price of the basket in the base year times 100. And this 100 is just to get rid of the decimal points, which is equal to 3.00 times 100, which is equal to 300. And so what we, and here's the P I'm talking about, this price index here. But we could have used the deflator the GDP price deflator. But anyway, if this is our price index, it's 300. What that says is goods and services that could have been purchased in the base year for $100 would now cost $300, three times as much. Okay, so that 300 just means prices have tripled. That's what we're using here in this GDP formula that I wrote down. We're using a price index. And this Q is real GDP. If you remember when we were calculating GDP the other day, we had a bunch of Qs, a bunch of quantities, right? We had, what, A, B, C, D, E, five goods, and then we had quantities of each one of those five goods. Well, those quantities really were the source of what we were talking about It's real GDP. We think about quantities. Real GDP is really a measure of the volume of production of goods and services. Okay, this is the best measure of economic activity 
uh, let me write one word in here to kind of as a modifier of real economic activity. That is to say, we're not just talking about a number of dollars that gets spent. We're talking about a measure of economic activity that takes into account how many units of, you know, cars did you produce, how many television sets, how many haircuts, but it's, we're talking about real economic activity, not just the prices. Okay, so P times Q, that's nominal GDP. Now, here's the thing. With this model of supply, or aggregate supply and aggregate demand, what we're going to do is we're going to come to terms with what are the forces that determine this? Determined by what? What determines GDP? And when we come to terms with this, what determines GDP, we're also going to learn what determines the price level for the economy and what determines the level of real GDP for the economy, real production. So this chapter of material, there's a theory or a model that we're looking at called this model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. But the whole purpose of this model is not to just talk about aggregate supply and aggregate demand. It's to understand the forces that determine GDP, real GDP, and, and the price level. And you know, th those are the things that we said in the previous chapter are pretty important for us to understand is GDP and the price level. The only other thing is the unemployment rate, and we'll talk about that also. Let's begin by talking about aggregate demand. I won't be abbreviating it like that. Let's do it AD. Aggregate demand. Okay. This will be a curve, a curve showing various quantities of real GDP that will be purchased at various price levels. And when I say price levels, I'm talking about the deflator or the CPI index. Let's draw the picture. And by the way, I haven't drawn the graph yet for aggregate demand, but this little quadrant right here with real GDP on the horizontal axis and the price level like the CPI or the deflator on the vertical axis, that picture, we're going to make a lot of those. So, you know, if over the weekend, if you want to like uh, make up a thousand of them and bring them to class with you next time, then you'll be ready to go. Maybe I've exaggerated. Anyway, but we're going to draw this same picture over and over and over again. These are the things that we want to understand. I just said that a moment ago is we're going to try and understand the forces that determine the price level and real GDP. And so here's the price level, here's real GDP. These are the things that we're going to try and understand. Hey, how does that get determined? And then those two things together, once we understand Oh, I know what determines real GDP. I know what determines the price level. Those just multiply together and tell us how much GDP is, nominal GDP. Here's the aggregate demand curve. Let me draw that in a different color so it's a little stand out maybe. AD. You can draw a straight line. You can put a little curve to it however you'd like to. I'll probably put a little curve in it on the first few times and enter while just a straight line. It doesn't make any difference. The concept's there one way or the other. Here's what this says to me. To me, this says that if the price level's higher, then people do not, there's not very much spending for this real GDP. The quantity that people would like to buy of these newly produced goods and services is pretty low when the price level's high. If the price level goes down to, um, here's P high, here's P low, if, if the price level goes down, then people would like to buy a lot larger quantity of real GDP. 
And this is not just people as individuals, but also businesses and the government and foreigners and so forth. Uh, we'll talk more about who it is that's doing the buying later on. But the point is, is that there's this inverse relationship between the price index and the amount of real GDP that will be purchased. Inverse relationship between the price index and the amount of real GDP that will be purchased. Okay. Now, who does this purchasing? Who purchases real GDP? Well, you know, we've kind of talked about this list before. Consumption spending, that comes from households. So households are spending money, and we call their expenditures consumption. Businesses are spending money to buy things. And when businesses spend money to buy things, what are they buying? Well, they're buying like capital goods. They're building factories and so forth. The government spends money. Well, I better just put in government again. You got government spending. Uh, let me not call it spending. Let me call it government purchases. And net exports, that's exports minus imports. You know, when we start exporting, foreigners are buying. When we start importing, foreigners are selling. So this is our business with foreigners. Who purchases real GDP? Boy, I'm having a hard time writing here, aren't I? I like to say that it's because I got a lot on my mind. But that wouldn't be true, so I won't. Who purchases all that real GDP? These four sectors. Now, where have you seen this list before? You saw this list before when we talked about, uh, hey, what do you add up to get real gross domestic, or gross domestic product? You remember we had two different ways of measuring GDP. One was through the expenditure approach, C plus I plus G plus net exports. Well, that's what these are. C plus I plus G plus net exports. So we saw that list before when we talked about that one method of measuring GDP. Well, GDP is purchased. You know, GDP is either produced or purchased. In either way, it's the same. If you remember our circular flow diagram, we had it that way. Here's the business sector and the household sector. And if you remember, businesses sent goods and services to the household sector. The household sector sent money back and these goods are, and, and services, that's real GDP. <coughs> and then here's the expenditures spent <coughs> on real GDP. And that's what we're talking about right here. And the money, though, it doesn't just come from the household sector. It also comes from government and the foreign sector and, and the business sector. But the idea is there is the spending for goods and services, um, that's half of the equation. That's half of the market. Okay. Now, you're... Um, what, you, what we can do is we'll add all these up at a point in time, like if we went out today and added all the spending by the households, all the spending by businesses, all the spending by government, uh, and this is spending for final goods and services. Uh, you know, we're talking about who purchases real GDP. Remember the definition of real GDP. This does not include used goods. It doesn't include, um, well, we had that list up here before. It doesn't include what? Um, uh, goods from the underground economy. But whatever's counted in real GDP then, we're talking about if you go out and measure the amount that households spend today for newly produced final goods and services, the amount that businesses spend for those goods and services, government and foreigners, then what we would come up with is something called total expenditures. or TE, total expenditures.
And so let's suppose that today, we'll just talk about today. Let's suppose today that the spending by households is, I'll just say $100, spending by businesses $70, spending by government $20, spending by foreigners $10. Then I'd add those up, and gee, I wonder what those add up to. That's a pretty hard one. $200. And, and that's why I picked those numbers, so I can add them up. What's today's price level? Oh, this is total expenditures. TE equals $200. Today's price level, today's P equals, I don't know, let's just say 100 So I would come over here. Let me get rid of all these other extraneous lines going through here. And so if today the price level is 100, and today there's $200 worth of spending, then those two things, today's price level and today's total expenditures, or this year's price level if you want, and this year's total expenditures, that'd probably be a better way of phrasing it. But this year's total expenditures and this year's price level give us one point on the aggregate demand curve. Just one point. Okay. But anyway, that is, and we had that for this year or last year, whatever, we could go get the actual numbers for what each sector spent and then the price level for last year, and we would have a point on the aggregate demand curve. But how do we generate all these other points on the aggregate demand curve? What explains them? And the answer is, well, if there had been a different price level, suppose instead of 100, suppose the price level had been at 150. And I'm not going to come through and do much with that, but I just want you to think about this. Suppose the price level had been 150. Then these folks would have spent different amounts, these different groups. And if these different groups would have spent different amounts if the price level had been different, then we would have had a different amount of total expenditures. And what I'm saying to you is if the price level goes up from 100 to 150, the total expenditures by this group would go down. By how much? I don't know. I mean, you know, hypothetically, I can make up something. But, but the point is, it's just less. That's all we know. Total expenditures, uh, let me see, I'll just say 180. And so we come back here. There will be a higher price level. And then people would react, people and businesses and government and so forth, react by spending less. And so now we would have another dot on the aggregate demand curve. And every single point, I mean, there is no aggregate demand curve to begin with. What we have to begin with is amount of total expenditures at a certain price level. And then we say, well, what if the price level went up a little bit more? And then how much would people and businesses spend? What if the price level went down to 75? How much would people and businesses spend? And so by asking that question at different price levels, how much would people and business and government and so forth spend, then we have created a bunch of these dots. And it's those dots that give us the aggregate demand curve. Let me see if I can connect the dots. But anyway, so now we've introduced two terms. And they seem a little bit the same. Here's total expenditures. And another term's aggregate demand. And both of those terms have something to do with total spending in the economy. Here's the difference. When we say total expenditures, we mean that spending at a point in time, like for this year. And we mean it's at a fixed price level, price level 100 or whatever. That's it. It doesn't change. We mean a single point on the aggregate demand curve when we're talking about total expenditures. And when we say aggregate demand, we mean all of those points of total expenditures. All of the amounts of total expenditures that would occur if the price level went up or down. And then that price level going up or down would affect us, how we behave. Okay, which brings us to the next topic, the next short little topic here, which is why does the aggregate demand curve have that shape? I just told you something, uh, and now I want to come back and explain it, but what I said is this. If the price level started at 100 and people were buying, uh, spending $200 uh, this year, and then I said if the price level went up, people would spend less, buy fewer goods and services. 
If they do, if they behave the way I said, then, then we get a negatively sloped aggregate demand curve. Higher price, smaller expenditures, lower price, greater expenditures. That's our negatively sloped curve. But the real question is, why do people behave that way? Why is it that if the aggregate price level goes up, people buy less? That's what we want to talk about. And by the way, the answer is not what you maybe think it is. Uh, if you'll remember back when we talked about supply and demand, I drew a demand curve. Here's quantity of good X. And here's the price of good X. And then we had a negatively sloped demand curve there, too. If the price was a dollar, people bought a certain small quantity, five units. If the price went down to 50 cents, people buy a larger quantity, uh, let's say seven units. There's a negative slope demand curve. But this is a microeconomic story. And it has nothing to do with this story right here. Okay, Here's what happened in this story is if the price went down, people bought more. Yes, they did. But when the price of good X went down and people bought more, they bought less. Y and Z and other goods. I was telling you a moment ago, we always want to keep it clear what's micro and what's macro. And I'm saying, you can look at just the market for good X, and you can understand that, and that's a fine thing. This is a wonderful model. But the point is, is if you want to start doing macroeconomics, you can't just stop right here and say, well, there's what happened. If the price went down, people bought more. That is what happened in that market. But there's other markets out there, and the macro economy includes them all. And over in the rest of the macro economy, there are other micro markets, market for good Y and Z and ABC and you name it. And so over in those other markets, what's happened is people said, gosh, I'm not spending so much um, per unit on this good X. I'm going to buy more X. And then they say, oh, I don't need that good Y. I don't need that good Z. But there are other markets that get affected. And so when you buy more of one and you buy less of the other, then in the macro economy, that's nothing. Yeah, more of one, one sector's up, one sector's down. How's the macro economy? Unaffected. So the point is, is that this picture, this story is different than that story. And we don't want to get those confused. I want to talk about why does the aggregate demand have that downward slope, but the answer is not the same as the answer here of why does this demand curve have a downward slope. Okay, so don't get those confused. Why does the aggregate demand curve have a downward slope? Why does AD have a negative slope? And by negative slope, I mean lower price level, increase in G real GDP purchased, or vice versa. If we want to turn the arrows around, we can say a higher price level and a smaller quantity of real GDP purchased. That's what we want to explain. Why is that? I got four stories for you, four reasons. First, there's an aggregate spending constraint. I'll start off where I was a moment ago with um, price level at 100. That's an index number. And a real GDP being purchased is 200. And then um, I'll draw a, well, that's a point. And I'll just leave the point alone for a second. Now, it's much more difficult to do this uh, example with the whole economy than it is for just a person. But here's the, the simple idea of what I mean by the aggregate spending constraint is this. Let's say I've got 10 $1 bills in my pocket. Okay. Then let's suppose that some prices start going up. And I'm paying those higher prices. I've got this $10 in my pocket, and I'm paying prices. To begin with, I'm paying prices, well, whatever this means. 
whatever this means. I know what it means, but I'm just saying I don't know how it relates to my $10 I've got in my pocket. The price level starts at a certain uh, point, and I'm buying goods and services with this $10 in my pocket, and eventually I run out when I bought this quantity. Okay, this times this. Maybe if I said I had, what would that be, uh, $20,000 in my pocket, this would be 100 times 200, and then that would add up to 20,000. However you want to do it, the point is, is that the money I've got in my pocket will buy this, at this price, it will buy that many goods. And I'm saying the whole economy is sort of that way as well. The whole economy doesn't reach into my pocket to spend money, but the point is, is in all the pockets in the United States and in all the bank accounts and all the businesses owned and the individuals and so forth, there's a certain amount of money in the pocket. And so if the price level is 100, then you can buy 200 units, and that's where we start off. Now, suppose the price level goes up to uh, 150. Uh, let's don't do it that way. Let's make it go up to, let's say, 200. There we go. If the price level, that doesn't look proportional, does it? I'll make it actually 200, double. If the price level goes up to 200, I still got the same amount of money in my pocket. You still got the same in your pocket and so forth. And now we go out and we start buying, but now we're paying twice as high a price and we start spending that money out of our pocket. And what do you know we run out when we bought 100 units of these goods, real GDP? And so let's come to here and put another dot. If, on the other hand, the price of goods goes down to 50, half the price of our beginning price, and we start spending money, gosh, I get all the way out here, I've bought 200 units at a price of 50 each, and I've only spent half my money. And so I got more money. And so I just keep on buying some more and some more and some more, and finally I run out of money out here at uh, 400 units. And so if I connect the dots, and I'm not done yet, but this is just that. This is the aggregate demand curve we, come, uh, we get with this part of the story with this aggregate co spending constraint. Here's what I mean by the spending constraint. I started off with that money in my pocket, just a certain amount, and that's fixed. That's my constraint. I can't spend any more than that. And so with the aggregate spending constraint, all I'm saying is the United States economy as a whole faces a similar situation in all the bank accounts and all the pockets and, and so forth. Uh, we have an aggregate spending constraint that's comparable to me having a fixed amount of money in my pocket. And so when we start buying, it depends on what the price is. If the price is a lot lower, we can buy a lot more. If the price is a lot higher, we can't buy so much. And if you'll notice, the way this is drawn, and this is not the end of the story, but the way this is drawn, let's go 100, that's P, times Q, 200 is equal to P times Q, and that's equal to 20,000. Then I push the price up to 200. We bought 100 units. P times Q is 20,000. That's my total spending. I don't want to call it that. I want to call it aggregate demand. And then if the price level went down to 50 and I bought 400, hey, that was a bad one, uh, bought 400, uh, aggregate demand, 20,000. So that aggregate spending constraint, that just says, you know, if the price of each unit's higher, there's, you can't buy as many units. There's not as much money to go around and vice versa. That's the first reason that curve slopes downward, just that constraint that we face. Number two, real balance effect. <coughs> What's going to happen is I told you I'd have four things here, and I'll come back and add those in in a second. But what those, the other three are going to do after number one is they are going to make this curve look slightly different. So we started off with this curve that has this particular shape, and it for sure has this sort of, it's convex toward the origin, you see it's pointing out, or concave upward. But the point is, is that we start off with a special shaped aggregate demand curve that comes about as a result of this constraint. And then I'm going to start modifying this curve due to the real balance effect and some other things that we talk about.
Okay. Here's what the real balance effect is about. Is it's about the uh, currency holdings of people. Suppose I've got $10 in my pocket. And by the way, that's pretty close to what I do have in my pocket. Suppose I've got $10 in my pocket, and I go over to McDonald's, and I say, how much for a Big Mac? And they say, $2. Now, that's great, $2 per Big Mac, $10 in my pocket. But here's another way of expressing that. I've got the $10 in my pocket, or I have the purchasing equivalent of five Big Macs in my pocket. Okay. The purchasing power of that money in my pocket is five Big Macs. Five Big Macs. Ten dollars, and let's write down, equal five Big Macs at two dollars each. Okay? Okay, so I've been going to the McDonald's every day and eating a Big Mac, let's say, for lunch. And so then I go back today and I say, okay, give me a Big Mac. And they say, okay, that's $4. And I say, oh, just a second, you made a mistake. Uh, I just kind of mentioned that to you. I eat here every day and they're $2. And then they say back to me, no, we changed the price. And I say, oh, is that right? And so now all of a sudden those Big Macs are $4 a piece. And I've still got $10 in my pocket, but now I can only buy two and a half Big Macs. Right? Same $10, but each one of those dollars won't go as far as before. Each one of those dollars only goes half as far as before because prices have doubled. So what I'm saying to you is this. And Big Macs is just meant to be an example, but I also mean if I went out to buy a car, maybe the price of the car had doubled. If I went to buy a new tie, the price of the tie had doubled. If I went to buy uh, shoes, the price of shoes doubled. So I'm saying that just in general, prices have doubled, because that's what we're talking about here is the, uh, the general price level, the overall price level. So if the price level has doubled, I can only buy half as, many, half as much merchandise. Here's what economists say about that. They say that inflation, and that's what we're talking about here is inflation. And I'm sorry for using this term in an example with Big Macs. Just the price of Big Macs going up is not inflation, but it's if the price of Big Macs doubles, if the price of cars doubles, shoes, uh, all these other things that you can buy, if they all double, we've got inflation. And so here's what economists say. Inflation imposes a tax on money balances. Meaning by that, I had $10 in my pocket. I had four Big Macs, five Big Macs in my pocket before, the equivalent of. I had five Big Macs. And now that the price level is going up in the economy, I've only got half as many Big Macs in my pocket. Inflation reduced the purchasing power. I've still got $10. But the inflation reduced the purchasing power of that $10. Inflation took away half of what I was carrying around with me. Still the same amount of green paper, but it just won't go as far. That green paper is not as valuable as before. So that was a tax on my money balances. And by doubling the price level, it's taxed away half of my money balances, what they're worth. Okay, so let's come back to this picture. We'll start off at that same point as before. Now the price level goes up, we'll let it double to 200. A moment ago, before we were thinking about the real balance effect, and just talk about this spending constraint. There's only so much money to go around, the prices go up, you can't buy as much. Now we've got something else to take into account. For those of us who own cash, I don't mean to say people who own stocks in uh, the market or bonds or whatever. I'm saying for people who own cash, that cash is worth less. And so when I go to buy this 100 goods, 100 units of goods that I was thinking about buying, all of a sudden I reach in my pocket and I go, wow, th that money has been eroded. Its purchasing power has been eroded. And you know, I'm a little poorer than I used to be. 
Now, when I say I'm a little poorer than I used to be, that is the real balance effect. These money balances, where's that term balance? Okay. Mm. The, the money uh, balances that I am holding, they are worth less now. Uh, not worthless, but worth less. And so even though I was getting ready to go out and buy 100 units at this twice as high a price, now I find out that this money in my pockets is not as valuable as before. I've suffered a loss in my wealth. And so then I say, you know, I better cut back just a little bit more to deal with the fact that I'm a little poorer than I was a moment ago. And so when I draw that aggregate demand curve, the aggregate demand curve doesn't just go from this point where we started, I'll call that point A, to point B. That's where it went if we had that aggregate spending constraint to take into account. But now I've got something else to take into account, the real balance effect, the fact that I'm slightly poorer than before. And so now the aggregate demand curve goes to that point C. By the way, it works in the opposite direction. Suppose I got that $10 in my pocket and I go into McDonald's and I say, price of hamburger, uh, Big Macs, $1 and the price of everything else. You know, $20,000 cars now $10,000. A $30 pair of shoes now $15 and so forth. Uh, $10 haircut now $5. If all prices went down, I'm still carrying $10 in my pocket, but that $10 which a moment ago would only buy me five Big Macs, now it buys me 10. And now I'm thinking, gosh, I'm rich. I'm carrying this cash around and that cash goes twice as far as it used to. Used to be this cash was enough to get me through, let's say, two days, and now this cash will get me through four days. I'm richer than I used to be. And so the point is, is if the price level went down to 50 and I was going to buy due to this aggregate spending constraint, I can now afford to buy 400 units. The fact that I'm now wealthier than I was a moment ago causes me to say, man, I can buy even more than 400 units. I can buy 420 or whatever this is. And I'll put a dot there. And so the aggregate demand curve comes down and goes through that point. And so what I'm saying to you is the aggregate demand curve's a little flatter than it was when I only took into account the aggregate spending constraint. Do you have to be able to draw this on a test? I don't think so. Uh, but you do have to kind of keep in mind what's going on with these relationships. If I said something to you like this on test day, if I say, uh, when the price level goes up, people suffer a loss of wealth and this causes them to buy A, more goods, B, less goods. I mean, then you should say, oh, yeah, yeah, loss of wealth, they'll be buying less goods, fewer goods. And that's the real balance effect. Okay. Now, how important is this? To me, this is the number one in terms of being important. But let's talk about how big that is. Here's the amount of currency, U.S. currency, right now is in the neighborhood of $450 billion. And so if the price level went down to, uh, let's say it went down by, let's take it up. If the price level went up 10%, 10%, and I mean that's kind of a lot, but still it's not a, a huge number. We had inflation rates in the 1970s and early 1980s that were more than 10%. So if the inflation rate was 10%, all prices went up 10%, I'm saying that the loss suffered in terms of real balances, the real wealth loss, would be $45 billion. The, the $450 that we had, its purchasing power would have gone down 10%. And that would be like somebody just came, you know, and sort of, while we were asleep at night, snuck into our homes and stole some money out from everybody in the United States, $45 billion worth. And so the next day when we go out to buy goods and services, we'd start going, wow, someplace $45 billion has disappeared overnight. I don't know where it is. And that would cause us to buy fewer goods. Questions about this? A third effect. Where's my list? Oh, right here. International trade effect. And by the way, I'm not going to keep on drawing this, but all these other effects that I'm telling you about right here, and we'll have a number four here in a moment, but all of them have the same general impact on the aggregate demand curve. We started off with the aggregate demand curve that was imposed on us by this spending constraint. And then all of these other effects are just going to make the curve slightly flatter. Over here a little to the left and over there a little to the right. So they'll all have the same general effect. 
Here's the international trade effect. And let me just kind of do this. Um, uh, I won't work on it too hard here. But if the price level goes up, price in the US, if the price level goes up, then sales to foreigners go down, right? If our prices are higher, let's say a $20,000 car then goes up to $30,000, foreigners who were maybe thinking about buying that $20,000 US car, now they don't want to at $30,000. They'll buy something else. There's something else that happens. Uh, if the price level in the US goes up, then purchases from foreigners That goes up. Why, why is that? And the answer is, if American cars go from twenty dollars to $30,000 a piece, then those foreign cars start looking a little bit more attractive, and we start buying more foreign cars. So let's come back to here. We'll start off at point A, and I'm saying if the price of United States goods and services goes up, then people react by buying more from foreigners. So here we are. If we're buying more from foreigners, we're going to buy less of US GDP. So that's a reduction of um, our purchases of domestic goods. We'll be spending our money overseas. And also, foreigners start saying, well, yeah, now that your prices have gone up, I don't want to buy as much. And so this distance right here between B and C, that is both of these things here, is we're selling less to foreigners, and we're selling less to ourselves, too. When we purchase more from foreigners, that means we don't spend the money here in the United States. So anyway, this international trade effect says if the price level goes up, we buy less American goods. We buy less, other people buy less. And it all works in the opposite direction. If you make the arrow go down, lower price level in the United States, then we sell more to foreigners, and we also purchase less from foreigners. So back to this story, if the price level goes from 100 down to 50, then we purchase more from ourselves than we were going to. We cut off our imports. And also, we sell more to foreigners. So there's a little bit more. And this distance from A, B, C, E, F, this distance, you didn't think I put a D in there, did you? That's for demand. Uh, but this distance right here is us selling a little bit more to foreigners and us buying a little bit more from ourselves once our price level goes down relative to prices overseas. Number four, used good effects. When we drew this picture right here, the aggregate demand curve, on the horizontal axis, what we're interested in is the amount of real GDP that, that Americans purchase, or that people purchase, but real GDP from the United States, real goods and services produced here. But these are newly produced goods and services. You remember that concept of real GDP. So new goods and services, and what I'm saying is this, if the price level starts to go up, people start thinking, man, prices are so expensive. Maybe what I ought to do is, rather than go out and buy some new merchandise, cars or refrigerators or whatever, I'll have mine fixed. Okay? And so prices go up. Rather than buy new refrigerators or new cars, I'll have mine fixed. I'll reduce my spending on new goods and services. Other people say things like this. Oh, prices are getting so expensive, I'll get that old junk out of the attic and have a garage sale and sell it to people. And all of a sudden, now we're selling used goods and services, and, and they're taking the place of new goods and services. If prices would come down, then people start discarding things faster. They go, yeah, I don't want this anymore, and I'll throw it away because the prices are so low, I can afford to buy some more. So if prices come down, we start getting rid of the used goods and instead buying new. And so again, all three of these effects, number two, and three and four, they cause this curve to be a little flatter. Here's the aggregate demand curve with just the aggregate spending constraint. And I'm saying each one of these other effects cause that curve to be a little flatter. And it never gets totally flat. I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying that is the effect that we're dealing with here. So back to the question, why does the aggregate demand curve have a negative slope? It has a negative slope for all of these four reasons. But the most important is this spending constraint. 
We simply cannot buy as many goods and services if the prices of all of them, and that's what we're really talking about here is all prices of goods and services. If all prices are higher, we simply can't buy as many goods with a fixed amount of money supply in the economy. Questions about this? The next thing that we want to take up is uh, what determines the position of the aggregate demand curve? What's it puts it right here versus out here someplace? Let me draw another one. Why is the aggregate demand curve at AD1, not AD3, or at AD4? So what we want to talk about, what determines the position? of the AD curve, aggregate demand. And really what we're trying what we're asking about is why does that curve shift out or shift back? AD1. We'll start off right there. Well, here we go. Let's set a price level at 100. And we'll have, again, we're purchasing 200 units of real GDP. We talked about a point on the aggregate demand curve a few minutes ago. We said that we have total expenditures when P equals 100. That's that point right there. And if you remember, total expenditures is consumption and investment and government spending and net exports. So what we're interested in, let's shift that curve out now. AD2, and let's come over to right here. Here's what we have. This was total expenditures before 200 when the price level is 100. And right here, we're now buying, and I'll put a number down here, let's say 250. But the price level, TE at P equals 100. TE at P equals 100. We got the same price level in both cases. That curve shifted. And why did it shift? And the answer is because the components of total expenditures had to increase. Either there was an increase in consumption spending, or investment, or government spending, or net exports. One of these things in total expenditures had to increase so that even though the price level was unchanged at 100, now total expenditures are just a greater number, a larger number than before. Okay, This was total expenditures began at 200, and I'm saying now total expenditures are 250. Why is that? That's what we're going to talk about next time, and that's why you'll come back next time. So long.